Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. and the United States, looking around the globe and 143 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices that can be used, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference for the environment in the 21st century. One of the largest players now, as we all know, in the economy and, of course, in the environment is the country of China. And we have uh, actually been very uh, pleased and honored to have such a great working relationship with Dr. Ping A, who is the president of the International Fund on China's Environment. And uh, Dr. Hay, welcome back. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And I need to say that uh, Dr. Hay has been with us uh, before, and this is a continuing series on China. And uh, Jason Wong had uh, mentioned to us in our last program, we need to start talking about energy conservation and efficiency in China. And uh, so uh, this is going to be the fast and furious about all the things that are going on. But tell us about the IFCE. What does it mean and how long have you been around? Well, IFCE is, uh, means the International Fund for uh, China's Environment. Uh, we are a non-profit uh, organization established in 1996 in Washington, D.C. And uh, our main mission is to promote the uh, U.S. and China environmental and energy exchanges. And uh, we're functioning in three areas, mainly uh, one is policy advising to both uh, uh, China government and the U.S. Also, the uh, second area is uh, technology exchanges. We're promoting uh, green technologies uh, to China also, uh, from China to U.S. I and, think uh, that's really very important to, uh, we need to emphasize, there really is a two-way flow and exchange right. between China and the United States. Many people think it's only one way, but it really isn't. <laughs> right, no, it's two-way. It's going way, both yeah. way. Right. And it really is to the credit of your organization uh, that we have such close exchanges going on. Well, well it's only part of them, but uh, um, right now the lump of the group in China is uh, taking place. Uh, one way it started, we um, identified one of our mission is to help you know, NGO to uh, grow up you know, in China, to develop in China. Uh, right now we see those um, NGO are getting very, very active in both the energy and environment issues. Well, you know, you really are, and I've said this before, you really are a pioneer because when you started in 1996, there weren't that many NGOs in the whole country of China. And right, to have right. one in the environment was actually even more unique. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then you're really almost like the daddy for so many of these <laughs> uh, NGOs over there. So uh, uh, we've all been uh, really honored to be able to work with you over these years. And, and uh, thank you for the hard work you've been doing. Thanks. But looking mm -hmm. at uh, the, the role of the nonprofits in this whole notion of uh, energy efficiency and energy conservation, what are the nonprofits doing in working with the Chinese government? Uh, energy efficiency, NGO um, began on uh, energy efficiency only about five or six years ago. Oh, when, uh, so fairly recent. Fairly recently. Uh -huh. uh, one of the uh, significant movement is to um, NGO group, you know, starting by a uh, few NGOs promoting the, the air conditioning um, you know, room temperatures a certain degree and not allowed too cold, you know, to uh, waste too much energy. So it's at, it's at 26 uh, degree of the, in the summer for room temperatures, then uh, asking for those uh, building managers to pledge. Then uh, once they pledge, and then uh, the organized volunteer to check um, uh, to make sure they, they, they fulfill their commitment. Then and, and really the volunteers though is not like they're checking on people, it's really to help them to understand the importance of the uh, energy conservation right, and to right. answer questions and to help them with some of the equipment that right. they actually have in their condominiums, their apartments, or their own homes. Right, after um, a couple of years and more and more NGO participated, more and more volunteers to, to go and uh, then government finally issued a, a policy. Say, well, oh, really? whole country, you know, especially public buildings, need to set temperature below the 26 degrees uh, Celsius in summer. Oh, so actually the NGOs were first. 
For so, and yeah. introducing this idea, right. and then the government actually established the policy, the policy afterwards. Is, right. I That's see. one of the examples of NGO promoting the energy saving and the energy efficiency, uh, you know, progress in China. It's fantastic. What a great idea. So, looking at uh, China itself, what is it doing as far as energy efficiency across the broad, broad spectrum of the society? Not just in the homes, but also in the factories and industries and, and commercial uh, real estate. Uh, China began the energy efficiency in early 80s. It's quite a while ago. Oh, okay. And, um, so it's almost maturing now then. Yeah. Uh, the energy efficiency picture can divide the three phases. The first phase from 80 to 2000. That time, uh, the government, uh, uh, the modernization process just take, uh, took place. And the, the government said the long-term goal, I mean, middle long-term goal for GDP productions to is a quadruple by uh, by 2000, but the required energy uh, consumption only be doubled. So to have to have the improved energy efficiency. Uh, uh, in order to reduce the energy cost, because they, they realize. So that's something that I actually don't think most people in the United States or uh, the West actually understand that China really had this underlying policy for energy efficiency from the very beginning mm -hmm. of the, the real expansion of industrialization in the country. So they're going to double the output, but they only want to uh, mean, triple the, the output. Uh, the carbon. Yeah, carbon but carbon only carbon double carbon the energy, energy constant. That's, you see, that's, that's light, you see the, right. the, the decarbon. If we the, can bring that up, we will. It's not uh, coming up right mm -hmm. now. But uh, so, the, so the government has been very much involved in this since the 1980s. Right. So then when did the NGOs uh, really start working with the government to get involved and to expand this through mm -hmm. all the citizens across China? Uh, that's uh, the, the, uh, talking about the first phase of to 2000. Then, um, when China get into WTO and uh, China export, uh, you know, pick up, and also the people migrate into uh, urban area, and uh, the government begin begin to build those highway, building those buildings, and uh, then the energy consumption picks up very quickly. And uh, uh, that's the phase of uh, 2000 uh, to 2005. So uh, and that was really where they're ramping up uh, very diligently for the Olympics as well that was going to be coming in 2008. Right, right. So that time the energy efficiency become less priority, you know, less important. So people were just, just kind of crazy to exporting products to US, to Europe, you know, so making quick cash. And also the urban expansion is very fast. So energy consumption become very, very, you know, dramatically increased and mm -hmm. uh, almost, you know, um, to the CO2 almost emission to equal to, to US. So then, uh, um, then come to the third phase from 2005 to 2010, the government realized it cannot go on continue like this, so they pick up the energy efficiency as, you know, again as, as one of the high priority and, and strategy of the uh, economic development. So they set a kind of a target, you know, during that phase in five years, the um, mandatory uh, energy efficiency increased by 20 percent. Uh, increased by 20 percent? So, yeah, in five years. In, in the five years. Right. So, so the uh, the government then set these uh, these broad goals, mm -hmm. and so really what you're doing is the nonprofits, just like what you're doing with your uh, nonprofit, mm -hmm. then is really a companion to the government right. to realize these savings for the whole society, right. and also it reduces the amount of expenditures that you have to send out over abroad to import fossil fuels and other right. kind of energy sources. Right. Right. Um, then for NGO sectors like us, we uh, you know like broader you know energy efficiency delegation to to from US to China in 2005, and then we another you know solar energy and the wind energy delegation to China in 2006. Now continuously, and you know, we um, introduce you know advanced technologies in energy efficiency and uh, and the renewable energies to to China, and um, then another areas we're working on public educations. We uh, our uh, office in Wuhan, like organized, you know, uh, uh, bicycle day, like a bike parade, that kind of stuff, to mobilize the the, the public to support the government policies. Well, you have uh, three offices uh, in China, and also I know that you have uh, very close working relationships with a number of the universities right, in right. China, mm -hmm. and it seems like the universities are just really getting uh, on board as far as a lot of research and development, original research. Uh, for new energy saving uh, technologies and also uh, energy savings products. Right, we have a partner with you know people uh, the university in China, the University of China, and the Wuhan University, 
uh, a number of other uh, a number of other universities, and uh, it provides capacity building training for mm. <coughs> for the uh, energy saving, uh, energy efficiencies, re renewable energies, in those areas. Well, I think uh, the China is is really uh, blessed to have you because what you're doing is you're identifying a number of uh, universities mm -hmm. and organizations, businesses in the United States and in Europe that are now working very closely with their counterparts in right. China. Right, right, right. And uh, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yeah, I travel to <laughs> China, you know, four or five times, time, four, five, five, five times a year. <laughs> uh, I tell you, that, that'll that wear you out uh, doing a lot of traveling uh, myself. Uh, looking at the transportation uh, sector, well, I know that there's uh, a real movement towards uh, all electric vehicles. Uh, automobiles, bicycles, motorcycles, mm -hmm. uh, even large-scale buses, which I was very surprised about. Right. What do you <clears> see <throat> happening in that that venue, and do you think that pace is going to accelerate in the future? Uh, transportation, uh, China put a lot of attention to public trans public transportation. Like you know, uh, China have the longest um, high-speed railway, and uh, <clears throat> also have uh, have. Um, yeah. Uh, in Beijing, Shanghai, become number one, number two of uh, metro uh, subway. Uh, it's one day in Beijing, uh, they have a, uh, the subway transmit 7.5 million people at uh, one day as a record pace of uh, worldwide. I think that's incredible because I was there for the Olympics. There were, I believe, 12 sub subway lines at that right, time. Right, not 14. Yeah, I was going to say, and they were building three and more. more. <laughs> right. While I was there, and it looked like every every subway line was brand new except for a couple of the you know the uh, you legacy know, ones. You know how cheap the the subway the fee it is. How much is it? About 30 cents for any anywhere, any any time you go, 30 cents. I tell you, it was just absolutely fantastic because I, I arrived <laughs> at the international airport. Mm -hmm. You know, I just walked out of the airport, got into the uh, Super Express uh, downtown, right. and then got out and then uh, took the uh, subway right to my hotel. And uh, there's actually a few places in Beijing, even as big as it is, mm -hmm. where you're not able to get somewhere by subway. Yeah, that's the uh, subway is uh, one of uh, um, one of uh, you know, strategies, you know, the the the, the build a public you know, transportation system. Another way, uh, when you talk about China is promoting the hybrid and, uh, and electronic vehicles, and uh, China is one of the uh, leading country to produce, you know, those uh, electronic vehicle, and um, the government is is planning to invest uh, 19 billion you know, dollars in the next three years. To, 19 billion yeah, U.S. dollars. Right. To, that's to, real money. Yeah, real money to in, into the hybrid and uh, electronic vehicles. Uh, it's willing to put one million in those kind of vehicles um, to on the street by uh, 2015. Yeah, and, uh, and that's really good too because I know that you're actually very rapidly changing out all those legacy power plants, those mm -hmm. old uh, right. coal burning, inefficient coal plants. Mm -hmm. Now you're putting in much higher, more efficient uh, coal plants, natural gas, and, and others. So right. uh, really blessed. So uh, thank you for being with us, and we look around the globe. Great. Bye. This is firstgov.gov, where we're obsessed with getting you government information. Brand new student loan applications on the site, baby. This calls for a celebration. Here's your uncle. So in the end, it was either take the astronaut gig or come work here. What can I say? Duty called. Dude, that's my cop. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's Sam's cop. Oh, sorry? Yeah. No. Sam's? No. Just log on or email us and right. get what you need. C, change address form. That's how it's done. D, driver's license renewal. Mm -hmm. E, uh, e, emailing social security information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice, well, that one. All right, that. Yeah. What are those? Government surplus cars for auction. You posted those online last time. No, you did. I'm posting them online this time. For all your government information, firstgov.gov. Oh, what have we got here? Sometimes you feel tired. You can't seem to lose those extra pounds off your midsection. And your joints hurt when you take the stairs. Well, you're getting older. But I'm happy to say that there's some simple things we can do to keep you happy and healthy for years to come. We can also lower your risk for some serious diseases the older population is often subject to. Proper nutrition is more important than ever. Your body has changed, you know. Not as many treats. A basic exercise plan. Lots of walks and fresh air. And most importantly, come and see me for twice yearly checkups to help ensure the best possible quality of life. Now, how does that sound? 
Improve the quality of life for your elderly pet. Schedule twice yearly pet tests. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome back to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States, looking around the globe and 143 different nations looking for the best technologies, the services, and the products that are available to take us through the 21st century. And we're talking about uh, dealing with a globe now that has actually over 7 billion souls on it. And we're highlighting uh, one of the countries, China, that has about 1.3 million citizens. And so what do you do when you have uh, 1.3 billion folks that need to have all the services and at the same time you want to allow for the very best as far as the environment is concerned and to protect the environment and at the same time to continue to grow the economy. So I have an expert with me who is a, a energy economist at, on infrastructure unit for East Asia and the Pacific region at the World Bank, Dr. Yubei Zhang, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm glad to have you, and uh, you have a good command of presence for television, so you're going to be fine. Looking at, and we're going to bring up the first slide here, because we you have some very important slides that uh, we want to have. Looking at the uh, energy consumption and the gross uh, domestic product, tell us what we're looking at in this chart. Okay, you see that uh, uh, from 1980 to 2000. Five that uh, GDP grows rapidly, and uh, so know that uh, when China starts its open door policy in 1979 and uh, put the economic development as the priority, so we see that from this period the GDP that uh, ten times increased, and the meantime you see the energy consumption also increased rapidly. And now China so realized that okay, it's not sustainable, and in fact, it's not only not sustainable; it's also a security issue. So I was going to say that really is a a national security issue, because that's something we find in the United States and other countries that if you continue to import more and more energy, uh, then you're depleting your foreign reserves, and you're not able to continue to reinvest in the society. And that's something that I think that your government's very wise to look at is keep this balance between uh, the growth of the gross domestic product and its investment in the uh, energy sector. So going to the, uh, the second slide that we have here, uh, what are we uh, looking at in this? We're going to stay very close uh, in the slides because I think these are very important. And uh, this is information, I think, uh, Dr. Zhang, that can be uh, useful to uh, other countries, leaders in those nations. Uh, they look at their energy policies and what they need to be doing to balance out this whole investment between the environment and economic development. So exactly, you see that. Uh, uh, so in terms of GDP, in terms of uh, per capita uh, energy consumption, China is not very high compared to the de developed countries. But because of China's size, so when you see the big box, now China becomes. Uh, the top one uh, carbon emission emitter. Yeah, and uh, even though it's uh, number two in the world, it's actually now number one as far as the uh, the CO2 and gas uh, emissions in the world. And uh, and again, that goes back to this whole thing of trying to have this proper balance uh, between the economic growth because right now you're growing at nine percent plus, and so how do you continue that growth? because of just the sheer numbers of people that are coming in every year into the economy. And how do you have the energy in order to keep uh, sustain that growth? Yeah, so now we realize that uh, growth may not be the top priority. So in 11th, 12th year plan, in 11th, the five year plan from 2005 to 2010, now China put energy conservation as a top priority. Right, and that, that's something that we're really talking about is the energy conservation, energy efficiency. So we think of China being, you know, one of the world leaders as far as uh, developing wind turbines and solar panels and uh, low-flow hydro, uh, you know, creating from uh, water. 
Uh, but at the same time, it's actually one of the world leaders as far as conservation and uh, energy efficiency. And I think that's something that the world really doesn't know much about. Yeah, so especially for the last five years, China has uh, taken the, the unprecedented effort to improve its the energy efficiency of its economy. And it uh, undertook uh, a large set of uh, an, uh, policy programs, regulations that cover all aspects of the economy. So what they're looking at is they're looking at every aspect of society, looking at the industrial, the retail, uh, the natural resource extraction, and then of course uh, the home use, uh, the citizens sure. use. And so they're trying to bring a balance between all of those. And uh, how do you think China's progressing as far as bringing a balance across these many different sectors? Yeah, so it covers all sectors as mentioned, but a strong focus is on industry sector because industrial sector consumes uh, more than 70% of the total commercial energy in China. Oh, that's incredible. And of course now transportation with the number of cars that are coming into the roadway. If you go to Beijing now, that's a gridlock uh, most of the time. So uh, the government seems like it's really focused now on transportation as well. Right, right. So transportation, building, are the fast growing sectors that consume energy. Well, and that's something that uh, people really don't know about is that the buildings uh, both residential, commercial, and industrial can be as much as 70% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions into the environment. And we, we really have a, uh, almost a total focus on transportation, United States on this, but actually buildings, homes and commercial buildings really has that. Looking at this uh, energy intensity trend in China, this I found very fascinating. I didn't realize this. I do a lot of reading about China and what's going on around the globe, but I didn't realize that uh, China was uh, taking this move. Tell us uh, to the viewers exactly what we're looking at. So you see, uh, it showed the energy intensity which measured as uh, uh, energy used per unit of GDP. And from 1980s to 2002, we see this steady decrease of uh, energy intensity, um, largely due to the uh, economic uh, structure change. And then you know that the China entered the WTO in 2002-2001 period, and then we see the, the lar increase of energy intensity. It's really alarming. <laughs> so China starts to take serious commitment to reduce its energy uh, consumption. And then you see from 2005 to 2010, and uh, China has this uh, a binding target, 20% now. Everyone in the world knows this 20% energy intensity right. reduction. And, and they're talking about the Kyoto Protocol, so it's yeah. all fitting in with that. So actually we meet the target. So in the five years, the cumulative energy intensity reduction is 90.1%. Basically we meet the 20% As far as the target, target itself yeah. is concerned. So you see this decrease of the graph. Well, even though the uh, increase looking at this chart was alarming, at the same time it was, uh, it was almost a minor blip within those five years. And then with the attention, uh, not only of the government, also of private citizens very much involved in this and the NGOs that are involved within uh, China, they were able to uh, get that under control. But the steady decline as far as the intensity, I think that's one of the things that's, that's a real lesson for the world. Yeah, and I just want to emphasize, it's, it's really a remarkable achievement because China is still in the rapid uh, uh, urbanization and uh, industrialization. So still a lot of energy is needed to fuel its economy. Right, well, and also uh, even though that you have this one-child policy and as far as uh, each family is a, uh, only uh, at least you know, one child, except in the very rural areas, uh, but you still have a, a, a gross number of people coming into the economy every year. Yes. And so there's a tremendous number of jobs that must be created year to year. And most of those uh, they need and demand some kind of energy. Exactly. And it's where people migrate to urban uh, area. Like each year, 20 million people move to urban. And you know that the urban households consume more energy compared to their rural Counterpart. Well, you think of 20 million people migrating from the rural areas into the cities, and we know that the world is actually rapidly urbanizing. 54% of the world's population now lives in the urban areas. And you think about 20 million people, I mean, that's the size of a number of these mega cities, like a Mexico or Rio de Janeiro. I mean, they have about 20 million in each of those. And it's hard to fathom that uh, that many people are moving and migrating from the rural areas. Okay. And so uh, looking at this, the, uh, the green uh, energy 
Uh, this is also uh, very fascinating uh, information that we have here. Uh, share this pie chart with us. Yes. So here, um, I've just uh, say, okay, how, what's the, the World Bank role in energy conservation program in China? So the bank uh, have played an important role. And you see that uh, uh, we have a green portfolio in China, basically. 90% of our investment is focused on renewable energy and energy efficiency. And uh, during the period 1990 to 2009, that uh, uh, we invested more than 1.6 billion in uh, green energy portfolio in China. Yeah, and that's really a remarkable number, 90%. Yes. That's incredible. That, that's a real dedication to or try to do something. But again, you, we're looking at it and saying, you know, it's remarkable, they're investing in that, but really it's uh, strategic importance. And this is something that I think, you know, even the United States, we don't realize this correlation between this high imports of uh, fossil fuels and at the same time having economic and social stability and security within the country itself. And this is something that China, you know, really wants to have the stability is really one of the cornerstones of the government. Yes. Now looking at the World Bank and uh, what it is that you're doing there, uh, what is some of the role of the World Bank? I, I know that uh, reading uh, your background, there's incredible numbers as far as the investment the World Bank has been making over mm -hmm. these years uh, within China and working with China. Can you share some of those statistics with us? Uh, sure. So um, the World Bank invests both we, we provide both knowledge and the investment to China. And as mentioned, that we, it, uh, in the last 10 decades, we pro provided 1.6 billion US investment in China, and both in renewable energy and energy efficiency. Yeah, and that's, that's really uh, very important to, instead of just putting into an extraction, but you know, really the, uh, the, the biggest uh, benefit from the investment is conservation and energy efficiency, because that's immediate. Yeah, and in particular, we bring the uh, market-based energy efficiency financing methods to China, because you know that China, they have very effective um, regulations, very effective administrative measures. And now that uh, we bring a uh, market-based mechanism to them to complement their administrative measures. I was measures. going to say the administrative and then the uh, market mechanisms and, and mesh those two together. We're almost out of time. Uh, tell us about this last chart as far as the uh, total energy performance and we'll end on that. Okay, sure. Uh, so World Bank introduced... About 30 seconds. Okay. World Bank introduced ESCOs in U.S. And now you see the ESCO business has really rapidly increased. And now that uh, uh, in 2010, the investment reached to we reached to 4.2 billion U.S. dollars. And let's compared finish. ESCO to means what? Energy service companies. Okay. We need to make sure we uh, define all of our terms that we have on there. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abe uh, Zahn, for being with us. And thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. One in eight Americans goes hungry. One idea helped change that. A community started a garden that blossomed into farmer's markets. One in six children lives in poverty. Of women found an answer by opening a daycare center that their neighbors could afford. Today, 36 million Americans live in poverty. But one by one, people are helping themselves and each other to change the picture of poverty to one of hope. For easy ways you can help, visit PovertyUSA.org. Two words for you. Pop quiz. Ready? Name any funny movie. A drama. Name a mystery. And one more thing. Name the movie your kids saw today in science class. Know what really matters. Know about your kid's school. And know about your kid. Find out 100 ways to know more, do more. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Welcome back to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States. And we're looking at the country of China, the energy efficiency, energy conservation measures that are going on there. 
and the huge investment that the Chinese government and also the private businesses and industries that have been making uh, since uh, 2000 specifically when they were gearing up for the Olympics and also China entered into the World Trade Organization. And we have a gentleman with us, is Dr. Uh, uh, Ping He, who is a good friend of ours and has been working with us for a number of years through the International Fund on China's Investment, and he is the president of that fine organization. And he is actually going to be uh, sitting in. We've been trying to get uh, a, a mutual friend, uh, Jason Wong, who is the general manager of the Galping uh, Ungo uh, PV Solar Development Company, who is also a specialist in energy efficiency and energy conservation. And we just haven't been able to get him on Skype. And so uh, Dr. Hay has agreed to uh, set in. So we have uh, the slides, the information uh, that Jason had sent over to us. So we're going to be using that information. So we can go ahead and put up the, uh, the first slide. And uh, Dr. Hay, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, I you you're doing uh, double duty to in our <laughs> television program. I had to talk about your, uh, your own program, and then you're back uh, covering uh, for Jason. But if we can bring the first slide up, uh, let's talk about this, the whole growth of this uh, energy service industry. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about that. What is this? This is something that's a new term in the United States, and I know it's a very rapid expansion in China. Right. It's actually not a new term in the U.S. Actually, the Chinese learned from the U.S. and Europe, and it's, uh, uh, it's called... Um, uh, energy service contract. You know. Yeah, and we've had these for years, but the whole thing is, is that most of the American public really doesn't know about it. Uh, basically, and, the and service company is to uh, invest uh, uh, like a building efficiency, building efficiency uh, first for the capital investment, then the, the share with uh, with uh, the, the client on the profit on the energy saving. Yeah, and this is something that uh, actually we have about uh, six or seven uh, companies that uh, we're working with right now. They're doing a similar kind of thing mm -hmm. around the United States. And when I was talking about it, it's new, it's something that came out, had a big splash, mm -hmm. and then, you know, with the uh, the boom of the economy, people mm -hmm. kind of forgot about this. And now people are right. using it as a way to go back and recapitalize their buildings and uh, and realize profits as far as their buildings by actually in incorporating energy efficiency and energy corporation. So uh, looking at these numbers here, this is very impressive. Going back to 2000 up to 2010, right. tell us a little bit about the trends that we're seeing here. Uh, the trends is uh, more and more uh, 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 factories and uh, even public buildings and the government, uh, government and they use this kind of service to reduce the pressure for initial capital investment for energy efficiency projects and uh, then the, um, build a long term you know, uh, gain but also uh, reduce the, the initial capital uh, investment for energy efficiency project. Yeah, and looking at this, the, these uh, numbers are actually uh, are really impressive here. You go from uh, what three companies uh, within 2000 and then go to uh, 934 in uh, 2010 so uh, that's a huge increase and it seems like that uh, just like everything that's going on with the uh, the economy and uh, everything else within the society it's just booming in all directions all right 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 because the energy efficiency become a national priority during the last five years, from 2005 to 2010, the government have a mandatory um, target 20% of energy efficiency in that five years. That means all sectors in society got to do the you know, uh, energy you know, uh, improvement. So, like building energy, you know, factory energy efficiency, uh, the government identified um, 1,000 factories as a, as a key target during that five years. So those five, those 1,000, you know. Uh, factories they basically consume about half of the total energy in China, so they have a you know, have a mandatory 20 percent of uh, uh, energy you know, uh, efficiency improvement. Oh yeah, and reduction in their use. Right. And we're going to have some actually some photographs of some of these uh, industries uh, at mm -hmm. the end of this particular segment. But looking at the, this uh, again, this growth as far as the energy service uh, industries, uh, there's some real huge numbers here. Right, those energy uh, energy service uh, industries they increased in significantly in last five years. Those three numbers, you know, revenue and total investment, and um, uh, China also um, identified in you know, the ten uh, area uh, a key engineering uh, program to uh, tackle with 
uh, like an industrial boiler and uh, combine the heating and the power and uh, uh, buildings and the uh, drive trains and, and, yeah, and uh, more electric efficient electric motors right 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 so um, uh, another area is the consumptions like uh, green labelings you know they, they identified you know um, uh, like 21 type of appliance to uh, make sure they combine with energy efficiency standards then if they they qualify they, they put them at green labels and they also um, require the government to purchase those kind of green green you know, products. So, so it's like, like the Energy Star program in the United States right, is where right. you're setting uh, various uh, industry standards before the appliance is even manufactured, right. and then they need to meet these rigid standards uh, for to help the consumers right. as far right. as decreasing the amount of energy right. that's being dis uh, consumed in that. Right. Uh, this smart motor uh, drive program uh, is just uh, amazing that uh, you know, they're looking at all the different sectors and ways that you can actually uh, improve. We can uh, in enhance that slide there for uh, Dr. Hay. Yeah, that's just one of the uh, one of the ten key uh, engineering projects identified in the last five years. Kind of smart uh, motor um, improve the uh, electronic motor um, efficiencies uh, through um, designing, re-engineering, and the, uh, you know, also advanced technologies, then improve those uh, efficiency of the uh, uh, electronic mo uh, motors. Well, I think the impressive thing in, in this, uh, Dr. Hay, is the uh, CO2 emission reductions. If you look at this, 9.75 million tons of uh, CO2 uh, emissions that are actually not being generated into the environment. Uh, that's that's quite impressive. Right. For average, uh, last five years, uh, every year uh, China reduced about 250 million tons of CO2 through this energy efficiency. 250 program. million tons per yeah. year. Right. Wow. That's very significant. That that is very significant. And the whole thing is is, uh, and this is something that I don't think that uh, many people that that see this around the globe understands the real commitment. And this is something you and sure. I have talked about before, the commitment that government, but also the industries themselves, because right. actually people think of green as being more expensive. It actually mm -hmm. helps you save more money. Long term is save money. Long term is save money. All those green, those uh, upgrades, you know, equipment upgrades, you know, productions, you know, uh, renovation, those are uh, save energy, save cost in long term. You know, that's uh, uh, also improved efficiency. Yeah. Uh, looking at this as uh, far as the iron and steel industry, now we're going sector by sector and looking at this balance between the energy efficiency, uh, energy use uh, over the years. Can we enhance that slide, please? Yeah, that's another, another sector China is uh, put on as one of the key uh, area to improve energy efficiency in the um, iron and steel industries. This, this iron and steel industry is one of the you know, bigger you know, consumer of energies. And um, a lot of a lot of uh, um, exhaust uh, gas exhaust pressure be wasted before. Now they try to re, you know uh, reuse them, reconnect them. So through those uh, advanced uh, uh, equipment, so this one has been uh, uh, achieved quite you know uh, good results through through this process. Yeah, and I think this is quite impressive. And the whole thing is that you really want a closed loop system. This is something that the re-engineering of the industries within the United States is that. In a sense, waste is a renewable resource in true, itself. True, right. So you have gases, you have mm -hmm. steam, you right. have water, all these that actually can be used for multiple purposes within the same building or within the same engineering uh, process. Right, and right. this is something that we uh, need to really think about. But this is something that's uh, quite impressive here as far as the uh, energy intensity. What is energy intensity? And then how does that uh, slide relate not only to iron and steel, but I think that you're doing the analysis, Dr. Hay, of energy intensity mm -hmm. across the entire segment of mm -hmm. the society. Yeah, the energy intensity basically is uh, it's how much energy you use per uh, unit of GDP. Like, you know, have a, you know, um, $10,000 uh, $10, uh, and uh, how much energy you use generally is $10,000 mm -hmm. in GDP. Mm -hmm. So from this picture, you see the China iron steel industry is, you know, uh, increase the energy efficiency um, from 680 80 to uh, 600, about 12% of energy intensity increase. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that's uh, actually if you calculate the total amount of energy you save, that's uh, very significant. And also CO2 re reduction is also uh, substantial. 
So those uh, um, uh, it's, it's not an easy task. Well, I think this whole thing, uh, Dr. Hay, when talking about this, again, looking at this balance between the environment and uh, economic development, which is one of the, uh, the long-range goals of the Emerald Planet itself, and I know with your own uh, organization, International Fund for China's uh, Environment, is that when you really invest in the, uh, the environment, if you do it wisely, it actually it, it brings increased profits to the organizations in many cases and certainly lowers your cost. Right. You know, just a couple of days ago, uh, China <coughs> decided <coughs> to phase out those uh, uh, incandescent uh, light bulb uh, by uh, 20, uh, 2016. And uh, so if you use energy efficiency light bulbs, you can actually save a lot of um, money you know, through this process. Oh, yeah. I know uh, as far as uh, we've been involved with the uh, green jobs training in Washington, D.C., and mm -hmm. also up in uh, New York City, so we've been involved in the uh, lighting uh, assessments within commercial buildings. Right. And sometimes you can lower the, the, the cost of lighting by almost 85%. Right. That's right, a right. huge savings. That's a, Particularly when it's about 40% of your total energy bill. Right. And if you can reduce it by 85%, right. that, that's, uh, that, that's a net net to the bottom line of uh, what it is that we're doing. Uh, looking at this is one of the plants that we're going to mm -hmm. run out of time here and I wanted uh, the audience to be able to see some of these. Uh, this is a cement plant. Cement is again one of those targeted industries where you're looking at uh, reducing energy use, uh, increasing the efficiency. Tell us what, uh, how the government and the industry is working together to bring about these efficiencies. This is probably uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jason Wang, uh, his, well, one of his client was on the, on the Shanxi province. Exactly. Uh, with heat power uh, plant, you know, from cement production. Cement production, you know, it's, all, it's a lot of energy, but uh, some energy, you know, um, being wasted. And uh, so mm -hmm. now they connect them, then uh, build, a, build a, you know, uh, with heat power plants, so they can generate power, you know, during the, during the process, process of the cement production. Right. So have two products, power and also cement. And also, too, at the, uh, the same time, uh, I know that there are a number of uh, cement and uh, even the fertilizer uh, factories in the United States are actually making as much or more profit off of then, producing of energy right. than they are of actually selling the product of the, uh, the right. cement or mm -hmm. uh, the iron and steel. But right. the, the thing that's very impressive to me, uh, Dr. Hay, since we both know Jason and we really admire his work, mm -hmm. is the, really how clean and how efficient uh, these plants are. And of course, this is the new face of China. Mm -hmm. We know what uh, came before, but uh, China is really working very hard to uh, not only clean the environment, but also to clean the industries and, and the workplace where uh, the citizens of China actually do their, their toil. Yeah, that's probably uh, it's one of, uh, one of uh, um, uh, investment by, uh, by private you know, uh, enterprise. Not, not just say state only enterprise have requirement, you know, uh, mandatory, you know, energy efficiency improvement, you know, uh, production upgrades, but also private in the industry also recognize the potential of those energy efficiency, energy saving projects and generate profit. So they, they participate very, you know, uh, gracefully. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Peng Hei, for being with us, and thank you for being with us as we bring you the Emerald Planet. Okay. books at the library. There's more than just books at the library. Excuse me. There's more than just books at the library. Livre à la bibliothèque. Hello. You have a lot of great books here today. You know there's more than just books at the library. I know. There's more than just books at the library. I don't want to be hooked to a machine. I want all the medical treatment available to me. I wouldn't want my family to have to make this decision. My doctor knows what's best for me. An advanced directive is your life on your terms. Talk with your family. Decide what's right for you. Then put it in writing.
Documenting my wishes today means my family won't have to make heart-wrenching decisions later. To learn more, visit www.putitinwriting.org. 1,200 American youth run away from their homes every day. The National Runaway Switchboard is here to help. 1-800-RUNAWAY. If you are a runaway, thinking about running away from home, or a parent or guardian concerned about issues facing your child, call us 24 hours a day. 1-800-RUNAWAY. back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome back to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. And we're talking about the country of China, uh, the second largest economy on the globe and at the same time it now is uh, the dubious distinction of being the uh, largest emitter of CO2 gases. But uh, we also know that uh, through the conversations we're having on the Emerald Planet and the series that we're doing on China and energy efficiency, energy conservation, and uh, power usage, is that there are huge changes that are going on within China itself. It is one of the largest manufacturers now as far as wind turbines, uh, solar panels, lofo hydro uh, units, and many other ways of producing uh, energy. Uh, and also it's trying to produce more energy within its own borders so it's not uh, uh, being uh, put in the situation of actually uh, losing some of the imported uh, energy that it needs and at the same time to be able to maintain the uh, growth of employment and the investments that are going on within society. I have uh, Dr. Ping He, who is the president of the International Fund for China's Environment, and Dr. Yebi Zhang, who is the energy economist, infrastructure unit of East Asia and the Pacific region. It's a very long title you have there <laughs> uh, at the World Bank, and not such a long title, uh, and very important. Uh, but I want to bring up this first slide because uh, we're actually going to be uh, talking uh, about what happened uh, recently as far as the solar decathlon and uh, China is really making giant strides as far as energy efficiency for uh, its housing uh, sector with 1.3 billion citizens that's a lot of energy is being used and I had the honor of meeting uh, Dr. Hongwei Tan who is the Vice Executive Director the Research Center on Green Building and New Energy at Tongji University, that's down near uh, Shanghai, the second largest city in the country. And they have what called Team China. And uh, what you're looking at is the Y uh, container here. This is a photograph uh, taken by the United States Department of Energy that hosted the solar uh, decathlon. And uh, so this is a, a look of those that came over and were involved in this and uh, Dr. Hay, looking at what's going on at Tongji University, I know that you work with many universities uh, around China and also in the United States. What do you think is the movement towards energy efficiency for the family in China through like the solar decathlon? Uh, China has a traditional um, energy saving, you know, for the family living and um, you know, in, the, in in my child time, and we save all this, you know, toothpaste, and all this, you know, uh, recycle all this, you know, small iron, steel stuff, and uh, so uh, just uh, in last uh, in 10 to 30 years, and people kind of forgot this kind of uh, excellent traditions. You know, we used to tell you, uh, you know, joking about uh, in 70s, you know, uh, you have sent a delegation to learn China how China recycle and learn, you know, China kind of you know, reuse, you know, materials. But uh, uh, in 90s, then uh, uh, Chinese sent delegation to U.S. learn how to recycle, how to, how to do <laughs> this kind of you know uh, activities. What's what's uh, what was old become new all over again? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, so, that's uh, our tradition that being thrift is good virtue. But then when people are getting rich, they think okay, the way to show rich is okay, we spend more. But now I think that the low carbon lifestyle is a new fashion yeah. and that we try to promote. Yeah, I know this is something that uh, Dr. Hay and I were talking about earlier as far as electric cars and electric buses and all that. And uh, actually now many people are going back to bicycles. Right. And you think it was what, not hardly 15, 20 years ago, people were riding bicycles all over the place and then mm -hmm. they moved into cars. Now they're saying, geez, there's too many cars, let's get back to the bicycle. Right. Beijing recently set a kind of special uh, bicycle lane 
and uh, for for you know a bicycle rider. Also, they have you know a rental you know kind of buy rental bicycles on, on streets, and they you know put some coins in there. So that's um, kind of um, uh, reverse the trend. As I mentioned, you know b before like five years ago, is people everyone were talking about a car, what kind of car you have. Now people you know want to go back and have more riding bicycle because Beijing just too. Uh, crowded, uh, you know, traffic is in gym is, is, is bigger. So bicycle is actually headed. faster than car. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you know, many times I was there, right. and, and of course when I was over there uh, for the Olympics, I've been back a time since, and uh, your modern uh, subway system in Beijing, of course Shanghai has one, and the other cities as well, and uh, it's just, it's just you just really zip around the city in those, come up, it's good for exercise. So it's really, it seems like China now is almost like, uh, along with the United States and other countries, is that you're putting in the physical exercise, energy conservation, uh, energy efficiency, along with a very modern lifestyle that you've developed in China. And uh, it's, it's happened very quickly. So looking at your uh, family, Dr. Zhang, I know mm -hmm. you're uh, uh, environmental uh, analyst and uh, working with the World Bank, but still you have your own uh, young family. Uh, that's developing. What are some of the things that you're thinking about as far as what your children are going to be faced over the next 15, 20 years? Yeah, so I want to tell a story actually that uh, so my parents who are living in China now, but they visited us a few months ago, and I have three year old at home, and so my mom told that. Uh, Oh, you need to conserve energy, conserve water, and to be uh, uh, a guard for our planet. So actually, my daughter will say, "Oh, uh, my grandma told me that uh, okay, when you wash your hand, just a little bit of stream when you apply soap, and then a little bit more water when you actually rinse it." So I'm so happy that uh, I think it's very important that from the kids, they need to learn and to have this conscious. Okay, our we have only one planet, and we need to do everything we can to save our planet. Well, I think that's, uh, Dr. Zhang, that's really true, and I know that uh, Dr. Hay has been at this for a long time with his uh, nonprofit going back to 1996, and of course mine goes back to 1973. So, <laughs> yeah, you're and, a veteran. <laughs> and that's really the first year that uh, we had any kind of contact with China, it was in 1973 through the right. Austria-China Society. Mm -hmm. And of course that's when uh, China was just getting ready to modernize and move forward uh, really towards the, uh, the 21st century. And uh, so now there's really this emphasis that we talked about the last five years going back and try to have an emphasis on energy efficiency and, and energy conservation. But looking at uh, families in China, and you're uh, moving around, of course, you know, you have families still living mm -hmm. there. Uh, how are they looking at energy conservation, energy efficiency, vis-a-vis -vis the world, just like Dr. Zhang was sharing with us about her, her daughter and her mother are working together on that? Um, people, um, uh, you know, um, right now, most young people, um, you know, um, are not that, to the, you know, energy efficiency and the energy saving, but the older people, older generation, uh, are more on that. And um, another thing I'd like to, uh, to point out, um, uh, China, about 20% of China family use uh, solar uh, heating water uh, for, for, for water heating. That's something I found amazing when you uh -huh. look at the photographs <laughs> of all these new high-rise apartment uh, complexes or condominiums as we call them. Right. I mean, there's just solar panels everywhere. Right. So that's, that's uh, China's the highest rate of solar uh, water heating rate in the world, more, more than, more than. Like 70% of you know, uh, capacity is in, in, installed in, in, in China. So that's, that save a lot of uh, energies and uh, also much cleaner than, than being the coal. Uh, another one, the, the families right now, the um, uh, NGOs are pick up, you know, for uh, educating the young people mm -hmm. and, uh, and the colleges. Like in a way, uh, been working with uh, a dozen ecology uh, campus to uh, train them to match the energy flow in the campus and then. Uh, figure out which buildings take more, which, which buildings spend more energy than other buildings, then make a recommendation to the to campus, you know, authority to, to improve energy efficiencies. Well, we've been using uh, Tongji, their, uh, the Y container, the uh, entry they had as far as the uh, solar decathlon, and in talk to, talking with Dr. Tan, he says that, you know, they're making their whole campus now, and I guess they have a, a branch campus, they're making, they want to be 100% energy uh, independent if possible, so you generate their own uh, energy both from wind and, and uh, solar. 
And they said now that they're reaching out to and providing consulting services to 125 other Chinese universities to be able to do the same thing. So Dr. Zhang, looking at the investment the World Bank has made, because it's been mm -hmm. over $8 billion has been going into uh, this effort in China, uh, is there a move now to look at uh, the uh, to expand this efficiency and expand the investments in energy efficiency and conservation? Yeah, definitely. And uh, uh, so you got, just now you mentioned the building, right? So we also have a, a building yeah, energy efficiency investment. And uh, we work with the government to uh, help with their policies. Because uh, in North area that uh, for heating, heating the, the biggest uh, energy consumption, uh, part. And then that's just because of the geographical uh, location e e exactly, of China and, exactly. and its position and, uh, uh, in the, um, in the traditional climate. policy is that based on the area, not based on the actual energy consumption. Mm -hmm. And now we're ho uh, helping them to pilot, okay, consumption-based billing. Because billing is really incentive for, for the users. Okay, how much I pay for how much I use instead of, okay, I just pay flat fee. So I put very high uh, temperature in winter and waste a lot of energy. Oh, so the policies then are changing so that people actually will be paying for their usage exactly. instead yes. of just a flat rate, right. which was uh, used traditionally. Looking at, the, say, going back to 1996 and some of the changes that you've seen, Dr. Hay, over these uh, number of years now, what are you seeing as far as the trends uh, through your NGO and the other NGOs that you're working with to really uh, push forward and, and to help mold the energy conservation, energy efficiency in China? Uh, I see uh, public awareness is significantly higher than the 90s. And uh, the first one is, uh, the, the, I mean, you mentioned the cost. You know, right now the cost of uh, uh, burning coal and the oil is higher than, much higher than before. So people see the bill increase and then they, they have, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, awareness of the reduced energy cost. That's the uh, economical reason. Uh, second reason is the environmental qualities. Because the people like in Beijing, Shanghai, a lot of cities, they have uh, uh, better incomes, and then they, they uh, also have you know, a high, high requirement for environmental qualities, for air quality, water qualities. So uh, through use of less uh, um, oil, less coal, and it also can improve environmental qualities. The second reason, the third reason is the climate change. Climate change is now, according to the statistics, um, more than 90% of the people realize that climate change is a, is a big concern. Probably in the US, it's much lower than that. Number is much lower than that. But the Chinese people, Chinese people realize that climate change is one of the big concern for the whole, uh, for whole planet Earth. Right. So um, the, they know um, now that China mainly is relying on coal and uh, emit a lot of you know, CO2. So reduce energy, uh, improve energy efficiency also can help uh, reduce the climate changes. So that's several reasons together and, uh, you know, public awareness, public policies. You know, I think right now the uh, Chinese uh, have pretty much, you know, from both the government and the public have a consensus to improve energy efficiency, improve the energy uh, environmental quality, also uh, reduce the carbon emissions. Well, thank you both for being with us and uh, we'd like to uh, thank Fungi University for letting us use your slides. Great. And we'll